Okay, looks like we have everyone here and I'll get started. So first off, thank you all for attending the first international workshop on effective understanding in video at CVPR and joining us for our invited speaker panel. I'm Gautam Prasad from Google and one of the organizers of this workshop. We'd like to extend a special thanks to our invited speakers for their talks, which you can view on demand on our YouTube channel. We'll start this panel with a few prepared questions and then go to questions from the audience. To ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand in the Zoom call, use the chat feature in Zoom, or use our Google form. To begin, I'll introduce all our speakers and then we'll jump into questions. Alesh Martinez is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the Ohio State University where he is the founder and director of the Computational Biology and Cognitive Science Lab. He recently demonstrated the existence of a much larger set of cross-cultural facial expressions of emotion than previously known, and the transmission of emotion through changes in facial color. Daniel McDuff is a principal researcher at Microsoft, where he leads research and development of effective technology. Daniel's work on non-contact physiological measurement helped to popularize a new field of low cost health monitoring using webcams. Previously, Daniel was director of research at MIT Media Labs spin out Affectiva and a postdoctoral research affiliate at MIT. Chunjun Lee is a postdoctoral scholar in psychology at Dartmouth College. She is part of the Social Computational Representation and Prediction Laboratory, working with Professor Mark Allen Thornton. Before joining Dartmouth College, she worked with Professor Ralph Adolfs in the Emotion and Social Cognition Lab at California Institute of Technology, where she earned her PhD in social science. And finally, Alan Cohen is an emotion scientist leading a scientific consortium and technology company called Hume AI and a former researcher at UC Berkeley and Google. His research uses computational methods to address how emotional behaviors influence the course of social interaction and relationship building and how they bring meaning to our everyday aesthetic and moral lives. Um, to begin with, could we go around to all of our speakers and um, get a bit of an introduction and a summary of your main points in your talk and how they relate to um, our workshop. And we can start with Alish. Um, I'm sorry, just want me to give a, a summary of my research, right? Yeah, yeah. And how it relates to the talk. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so one of my interests right now in the research that we do is um, the recognition of intent, and that obviously includes emotions. Emotions is part of understanding the intent of others. Intent is considered one of the hallmarks of um, human cognition. It's uh, one of the things that separates humans from most of other animals, not all, but most of other animals. Some apes also have recognition of intent, and there's debate on whether some other animals also have recognition of intent. Uh, but basically, this is um, a component of what's usually called in psychology and neuroscience theory of mind. And theory of mind is the ability that humans have to think about what other people are thinking about. So I can be thinking about what you guys are thinking about what I'm thinking right now. And this is a very profound iterative process that can go on forever. Um, computers in recent years have made, made amazing advances, or computer science, I should say, has made amazing advances, in particular in computer vision and machine learning and NLP. But uh, we're still, you know, eons away <laughs> from being able to develop AI or computer systems that are able to behave like humans in a more cognitive, high level cognitive uh, way as the recognition of intent and other parts of theory of mind. So I'm very interested in that. Um, in my lab at Ohio State, we do very interdisciplinary research. We do research in, obviously, computer vision. I've been very involved in CVPR. We actually um, organized CVPR back in Columbus in, I think it was 2014, if I'm not mistaken. That was a few years ago. Uh, 
but I've always been very involved with CVPR and um, the other conferences like CCB, CCB, etc. But I'm also very active in the neuroscience community and uh, less active, but I'm also sort of active in the cognitive science, cognitive psychology and social psychology um, communities where I also attend some conferences and we present our work because our work has implications in all these different areas. So we bring in a very multidisciplinary approach in trying to create models, computational models that, is, that emulate what humans do. And for this, I think it's extremely relevant to understand not only psychology, the literature in psychology, but also the literature in neuroscience. So psychology, you can interpret it. And this is why I talk about the, a, a little bit of what I discussed in my talk. Psychology is um, what David Marr used to say, the high level of the three levels of implementations that he had, right? the computational level, the very high level description, whereas neuroscience is the implementation level. right? And uh, when you create the model, there is a huge gap between these two, um, these two different levels. And um, that's a little bit of what we do. We try to work at all these different levels with these models. And as you said in the introduction, in the past, uh, in three different PNAS papers, we've introduced a number of facial expressions of emotion that is much larger than um, Darwin and uh, Duchenne and Darwin had proposed. And even, I mean, this is a little bit unfair because even Aristotle had proposed some of these <laughs> basic uh, facial expressions a uh, few centuries before them, but at any rate, Aristotle and Descartes also proposed them. Um, but we showed that there is a much larger number of facial expressions universe, almost universal to use. I could say universal because we test every single culture, but we tested 35 different cultures, which is a pretty large number. Um, I want to make a comment here that when I say they're universal, I mean that about 35% of the time people understand that production and of that uh, facial expression as having a common meaning. Now, 35% is much, much higher than random or a chance. Um, so it is a scientific finding that's very important, but um, that doesn't mean that when I look at a specific person, a single person, I am able to recognize that person's emotion uh, from just a single signal like a facial expression, meaning facial muscle articulation, by the way. Um, <clears throat> there are so many nuances. Uh, there's this additional 65% of the data that does not align with that. So it is, in my view, impossible for a number of reasons. I discussed in a, in a paper not too long ago, about a couple of years back um, in the uh, journal Psycholog Psychological Sciences in the Public Interest um, with Lisa Barrett, Fel uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, uh, actually uh, all, uh, Ralph Adol was also involved in that, uh, Stacy Marcella and others. Um, so I really encourage people to look at that paper um, because we discuss, you know, the limitations of understanding emotion. And then we had, as you mentioned, that other paper we showed that when people experience emotion, um, let me back up a little. So when we experience an emotion internally, we experience a number or our central nervous system executes a number of computations, right? That's what experiencing emotion really is. If you believe that this system is nothing else than a, an execution of a number of computations, then um, <clears throat> when that happens, some of these computations actually is the release of peptides, neuro neuropeptides, uh, the most famous neuropeptides are hormones. Um, and then what that does, it changes the blood flow and the blood composition. And it turns out that the face is innervated with a huge number of blood vessels on the surface of your skin. So you are, your face actually pulsates in color uh, when you uh, experience emotions. And it's not like the big flush that you get sometimes when you're embarrassed, right? They're very tiny pulsations in color, but we've shown um, in that PNS paper that you can detect um, over 20, I think, um, emotion categories just based on the color alone. And this is actually more reliable than detecting or working with the facial muscle articulations. We've done work with body pose as well. We've done a lot of work on context, 
uh, context is extremely important, especially in video. So I encourage people to work with context. You cannot understand the facial expression, meaning facial muscle articulations, or even the color or the body pose in isolation. You need to understand the context, the contextual information around that person, as well as what that person is, where that person is situated in their culture, their background, who are they interacting with. All of this is important. Um, and then moving back to a broader picture um, of recognition of intent, we want to understand the bi biological motion of agents to understand whether actions are done intentionally or non-intentionally and what they mean. And recognition of intentional actions is extremely relevant. So you can think in the US judicial system, for example, if you commit the crime, say murder, if it's a non-intentional murder, that's called manslaughter. And most people don't even go to jail for that. But uh, if it's intentional, this is either second or first degree, you could spend the rest of your life in prison. So that's how important intent is in human law. So a uh, recognition of intent to me, it's this next uh, big step. Awesome, yeah, thank you. Um, and maybe next we could do Daniel for an introduction on his talk and how it relates to the workshop. Thanks, yeah. Um, in my talk, I, I mostly talked about physiological measurement um, in part because I, I completely agree with, with Alex in, in terms of um, what other things beyond facial actions can provide in, in helping us understand uh, emotional states or expressed um, emotions. So uh, blood, blood flow, changes in heart rate, uh, changes in, in respiration, um, I, I would say are equally as useful as, as measuring facial actions for um, the communication and uh, an understanding of, of affect uh, from when you're looking at um, an, an individual. And so we've been working a lot on, on vision techniques for recovering these signals, um, in part because it's using the same modality as we would use for um, detecting facial actions. And also, uh, again, you know, building off what Alex said, uh, video gives us, unlike many wearable sensors, gives us context um, in, in some cases. So we can see um, the scene or the environment uh, of the subject, um, their, um, uh, you know, other pieces of information that can help us interpret uh, what's, what's going on. So for, for various reasons, being able to do measurement from uh, of physiological information from video is, is, is interesting for several applications. And we're mostly focused on, on health and well-being applications. Um, where we're, we're looking to use these measurements of physiology, both for um, detecting vital signs, which might be used in traditional clinical contexts, but also expanding that to look at affect, um, you know, and signals that might not be traditionally used in, 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 cl in clinical settings like stress or, um, you know, measurements of, of autonomic nervous system activity um, and how we can potentially expand the way that we can um, think about vital signs. Vital signs could be, a, you know, many more things than simply heart rate and blood pressure. Um, so that's, that's um, why, why I focused primarily on, on um, physiological measurement. And uh, it, within that, um, we have a, a big focus of using synthetic data um, again, for several reasons um, to, to help train our algorithms. One is uh, being able to um, create data sets with a large amount of diversity, both in terms of um, motion, illumination conditions, demographics of the, the subject, uh, clothing, all of those types of parameters. Um, but also synthetic data gives us uh, the ability to um, create very precise alignment between um, uh, our input signal, which might be you know, RGB uh, images and uh, different types of ground truth. Like we can, we can get very precise depth information, very precise segmentation information, but also very precise um, physiological um, signals, which we use to drive um, the, the avatar or simulation. Uh, so th those things are, are very interesting. In terms of 
uh, the, what we're applying that to is, is looking particularly at longitudinal measurement of, of affective signals. So a lot of the work, um, a, lo a lot of work in the past has focused on more sort of um, instantaneous measurement or measurement over short time periods. And this is something we did a lot at Affectivo was looking at people's reactions to, for instance, like video ads, uh, where you're analyzing someone's reaction for say 30 seconds. Uh, but in terms of when we think about well-being and how affect plays a role in well-being, I think that's only really possible to understand if you can observe um, these changes longitudinally and be able to personalize algorithms to particular individuals and look at how an individual changes over time or their behavior changes over time. Um, so we've been doing some longitudinal studies to look at diurnal patterns and um, uh, you know, time varying patterns uh, across um, large amounts of data um, in situ. So um, by, by deploying some of these vision based algorithms with people's permission to, to track um, both facial expressions and physiology um, in situ, we've been able to find uh, some really interesting patterns, both in physiological um, uh, changes across the course of a day and always, but also facial expressions or, or, um, expressed affect across the course of a day. Um, and ultimately we want to be able to provide people with tools to help them, uh, manage, um, stress and manage, uh, affect, uh, but the sensing is, is sort of a foundational piece that we we're building to enable that. Uh, thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, Chu Jen, would you like to give your own introduction? Yeah, thanks, Gotham, for your introduction. Um, so uh, I'm Chu Jin. So in my PhD work, I focus on uh, understanding how humans form trait impression about other people. For example, now we're looking at the screen showing four people's faces here. So I study how people form impression about their personality just based on looking at their faces. Um, yeah, so in one of our recent work, we found that even though people can use a lot of words, um, like extroverted or intelligent or um, different words to um, describe other people's traits from their face, but all of this trait impression can be summarized by only four dimensions, like uh, their warmth, competence, um, femininity, and youth. Um, so in my postdoc training, I have um, extended my interest to understand mental states, like how people infer other people's mental state, in, uh, including effect like emotions and other broader cognitive processes like decision making or um, planning. Um, and then we, I also try to extend the stimuli from more artificial ones like the aesthetic photo for face image of a person to like more naturalistic videos. Um, so in the talk, I have mentioned how the process of uh, inferring other people's mental states and inferring their traits are connected and even causally infecting each other. And um, so I think these two human cognitive processes are also important for um, computer vision or machine learning because um, I saw some recent paper trying to like um, build an algorithm that try to uh, teach an agent to understand other agents by capitalizing on this human cognitive processes components. Um, then in a broader team effort in uh, my postdoc lab, we're actually trying to also apply more recent development from machine learning and computer vision to see um, whether we can understand how people interact in natural environment. For example, recently we tried to apply um, algorithm that annotate body pose when people uh, interact naturally. And we want to understand whether from those pose feature, we can tell how people synchronize when we um, interact with each other or how people use this uh, body motion pose to, um, uh, to inform uh, how the other person's personalities are or their mental states are. Um, 
So this is the first time I participate in this conference and I'm excited for it because I want to learn more new stuff from computer vision and machine learning to see how we can apply those uh, new development to our psychology and brain science research to understand uh, human behavior. Thanks a lot, Juchun. Um, and Alan, would you like to give a bit of an intro? Sure, uh, thanks Gautam. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, as Gautam noted in this introduction, uh, my work is focused on developing new ways of studying human emotional expression um, and emotional experience. And I've taken a more data-driven view of how you ask those questions and how you ask what people take away from facial and vocal expressions, uh, what uh, they mean in terms of self-report, um, how they correspond to uh, different antecedents in the environment, how universal they are across cultures and how you build models that um, interpret these uh, behaviors. Um, so uh, that was uh, basically the focus of my academic work under my PhD. Um, I did a stint at Google as a visiting faculty researcher with Gautam, uh, where I helped uh, establish affective computing efforts. Um, and on the industry side in general, I, I ended up advising other companies um, during my PhD as well on how to build empathy into AI technologies. Um, what I saw time and time again over the years, uh, both in academia and in industry, is that uh, there's a search for better data um, to develop more cumulative theories of emotion um, and build technology that can make predictions about uh, pe what people care about, you know, what people take away from perception, from the perceptions of emotion, um, what, how that influences social interaction, um, how uh, emotional expressions uh, can potentially give you a window into people's health, well-being, um, as Daniel uh, was noting. Um, so more recently, I left to uh, form a private lab called HumeAI, and our goal is to do large-scale experiments uh, to gather uh, unbiased data uh, with many cues to emotional expressions and people's self-report, um, and to be able to make predictions um, from people's emotional expressions that are relevant to relationships, that are relevant to uh, people's health, and so on. Uh, and so what really excites me about this workshop is, is that we're taking uh, video data and we're predicting emotional behavior. Um, and I think that's uh, a really nice direction. Um, I think we should, in general, move away from sort of pre-selected features, um, more toward uh, directly predicting things that are of relevance uh, that we ultimately want to understand, um, you know, like uh, what people take away from emotional expression, like what they're feeling. Very interested um, in, you know, integrating things uh, like uh, heart rate as, as uh, uh, Daniel is doing and, uh, like facial coloration. I think what we uh, really should do is think about how we can find the right data to be able to uh, build predictive models from all of those things and, and see the extent to which each of them predicts, uh, you know, psychologically relevant and significant features like self-report and uh, health and so on. Um, so very interested uh, in uh, discussing this further. Oh, thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for their intros. Um, to begin with, one question for the whole panel, kind of building off what Alan talked about is, in the last few years, we've been able to use these spatial expression data sets that have been publicly available and are necessary to do deep learning. Um, and now to push this field forward, we're trying to look at other signals, whether they are in modalities, um, kind of like um, physiological signals or simulated data. Um, what do you guys think, um, are the bottlenecks in creating rich data sets and how should we prioritize what types of data we need to be able to model affect better in the future? Um, yeah, and anyone chime in, feel free to discuss it freely. I'm happy to go first. Um, I, I think we need that data, there's no doubt, but they wanna caution people on how we create that data. Self-report, because emotions or affect is difficult to determine. Self-report is not a good measure of the emotion that someone is actually experiencing. Um, it's still unclear how we interpret our own emotions. <laughs> and we all obviously interpret them differently depending on the situation we're in, uh, the culture we're in, the uh, context, et cetera. So, I mean, if you wanna play a game, right, with a family member of yours, uh, maybe at night switch the decaf coffee for regular coffee, 
and see how they become anxious and they feel like, oh my gosh, uh, something's, I'm really nervous because of work or, you know, something happened to me today. And no, you just had caffeine. <laughs> it's very difficult to interpret the signals, these internal signals that occur in our body. So self-report is not ideal. And the underlying uh, condition is very difficult to determine from physiological signals because uh, we don't know what the actual experience is. So we cannot find the actual correlations or, or features, uh, physiological features that only occur for specific affect conditions or emotions and not for others, right? So uh, again, uh, I would encourage people to read that PSPI paper. We give some ideas there of things that we think should be done, but uh, we need data for certain. I mean, we're data scientists at the end of the day. Uh, <laughs> So I really encourage people to build these data sets, uh, but be uh, cognizant of those uh, problems. Yeah, I think those are great points. Um, I really like what Alan presented in terms of, um, you know, bringing in context to some of these data sets. And I think the more, more that we can do that, the better. And context can look, um, you know, can have many different sort of properties. Uh, so the, the more that we can get um, the, the the situation that that these these videos or these data are occurring in, the better. Um, and even though self-report of emotion might be difficult, um, self-report of what people's intentions are in specific situations or you know other pieces of information um, to help to help uh, help with the interpretation of what's going on. So people can often, can often report what they, um, uh, you know, in a particular situation, what their intentions were, even if they're not able to um, report what they were feeling. Um, and, and I think the, these types of other information that we can, we can bring into how we model just the, the physical appearance of of the face in and how that might be interpreted um, can be very valuable. Uh, and then also the more that we can get, um, you know, again longitudinal data or um, data that allows us to look at um, how how to do a better job at, at at normalizing for particular individuals or particular cultures or particular um, contexts. So it may not be that we need lots of longitudinal data for a specific individual, but um, longitudinal data within specific contexts or situations could be um, very valuable. Uh, so all of this is a long, long way from the, the types of data sets that we had, have had in the past and even currently have, which are typically short videos or um, even just images uh, of faces. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely agree. Self-report is not the only thing that we need. Um, we probably need something to decide what we need, right? We need to decide what it is that's relevant to collect. What are we predicting? Does self-report predict it? Can we capture it as well with facial expression? Um, in some cases, you can't really do any better than self-report. For example, if I ask somebody, hey, was that a satisfactory response from Alexa? Uh, and you're, you know, it's an actual context in which you want to know <laughs> whether somebody felt like it was a good or a bad thing that they're feeling, uh, then it's probably better to trust what they say than to say, well, you were smiling, so I think you're probably wrong about that. <laughs> Actually, I think that was a satisfactory response. So I think in some cases, self-report is kind of the scene qua none, and we need to go by something. To, uh, we need ultimately to defer to people's own priorities, their own values, their own uh, you know, what they want out of technology. And I think that has to ultimately guide our development of technology. Um, if we could predict the things that people actually say they want from their behaviors, I think that that would be the gold standard. Um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, join too. Um, so this question actually remind me what I was thinking about when I was listening to Alan's talk. Uh, well, first of all, very great, cool data sets, Alan. I especially appreciate your effort to collect cross-cultural data. Uh, so I think one challenge is how to collect 
data when people are naturally doing it. Like when people know that they were being watched when they record themselves to watch a video, I think they also react a little bit different. Like this um, in psychology research, we, we already know that even when you see on the computer screen, there are two dots that looks like an eye, uh, the eyes looking at you, your behavior change. So I think one challenge is how to collect big data in a natural way without violating people's privacy. Um, and the second point I think is collecting multiple module data is also important. Like we can see people or infer people's emotion from the face, from the body that we can see, but actually in the literature of uh, emotion embodiment, we also say that we feel our emotion in different part of our body. Like we sometimes feel it in our chest, we feel it in a tight belly, and we feel it in every part of our body. So actually that related to Daniel's work that um, maybe we want to combine them with like physiology, like measurements. So with this multi-module data, we might be better, um, like with this rich data set, we might be better at like predicting people's emotions or understanding our affective like, feeling. Oh, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for all those cool answers. Um, another question that we were thinking about is we can use a lot of effective understanding technologies in applications such as healthcare or human robotic interactions. And um, amongst the panel, what do you think are the most exciting applications and how will that infor inform like what attributes around effective um, annotations you want to collect or what types of models you want to build um, based on like what would be most likely to help people or to be rolled out in practice. I think we should go in reverse order now. So I'll let Shushun go first. Yeah, um, would you mind to repeat your question, Gotham? <laughs> yeah, like what um, applications of effective technologies are you most excited about? Oh, cool. Yeah, definitely excited about how to use it in like psychology research to understand human behavior. Um, as I mentioned, we try to apply um, algorithm that automatically annotates body pose um, from videos. But then actually we face a lot of difficulties. Um, first is, um, when the body is outside, like like in the Zoom call, you only see my upper body. Um, and then there's some algorithm that try to predict other parts of my body's pose. And um, so like when the body is only part of uh, visible, there's supposed to challenge how you estimate the whole body pose. And um, there's also when some someone just walk uh, across and the, so it's covering part of my body and that's also challenging. And um, another one in my research is, I want to understand like how people keep track of one target when they're watching a video. So um, the other question is how do we um, try to track the same person's pose, like identify this is the same person across different cuts and uh, scenes. Uh, we kind of try to overcome this by combining the post algorithm with the face identification algorithm. So we see whether like, for example, there's two track of body pose, and then we see uh, at the same time, the face identification for these two track and whether we can combine these two algorithms to, um, to tell us which track belongs to which person. Um, yeah, so I think, if there's like, because like now in psychology or brain science research, we really want to um, extend our traditional similar set to more natural complex one, but the, we need a tool to identify um, those stimuli. For example, if I want to study video, um, I can just pick any video that can satisfy my that, that can give me whatever result I want, basically. But um, 
because like if I, I want to see uh, whether people update their trade impression then when they're watching video, right? Then I can just find videos that where people trade impression change a lot or where they, um, so, so the problem is, okay, now the stimuli is becoming more complex. How do we sample it? So um, one solution that the computer vision community might help is if we can uh, say quantify a lot of feature of this video, um, like effect, like how variable the effects are from these videos or um, pose, then we can just quantify them um, as like dots in this high dimensional space. And then we can representatively sample them without any bias in selecting the stimuli. Um, so I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just want to plus one that I guess, well, the reason I got into this research is uh, to improve uh, metrics for psychology. I mean, there's so much you can do in psychological research with unbiased measures of people's emotional behavior. Uh, if you can apply them at a large scale without lots and lots of manual annotation, which is usually the limiting factor. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, there's just to name a few, I mean, developmental psychology, um, understanding uh, risks for developmental disorders, um, understanding uh, the development of personality and understanding the development of, uh, you know, personal behaviors and what you prefer later on in life. I mean, it's, it, there's so many questions in developmental psychology. Um, and so too for, you know, mood disorders, understanding what are the triggers of uh, bouts of depression? How can we react to them faster? How can we measure mood disorders for the sake of uh, developing treatments more efficiently? Because uh, right now our measures are not very reliable. We create more passive measures. Um, there's lots of technological applications that are very interesting. Um, developing digital assistants uh, that are more empathic, that can understand what you want when you say you're frustrated, change their last response. Um, when you uh, are tired, you can speak to you more quietly and gently, et cetera. Um, uh, social robots, um, very similar. Uh, so many applications. I guess from a, from like a long-term standpoint, I'm most excited about the idea that uh, we could potentially build um, AI tools and models that are optimized for people's uh, or proxies of people's emotional well-being or, you know, our values, what we want to feel in different circumstances. Um, because right now, I mean, we build these, uh, these algorithms that are optimized for human behaviors, like click through on ads or engagement, um, or, you know, the first thing that we click on when we're searching um, there's, uh, you know, a risk in that that's inherent in optimizing for human behavior without having any visibility into what people are feeling, which is that you could be optimizing for behaviors uh, by uh, increasing the wrong emotions, right? <laughs> um, so, for example, uh, even in just something as simple as search, and I think search is sort of a, a generalizable thing, everything kind of comes down to it. Um, uh, in the realm of search, you know, search algorithms can get depressed people to click on things earlier by servicing results related to seeking therapy, that's great. But, you know, if the search algorithms can also get depressed people, you know, people who have recently searched for antidepressants, for example, um, by to click on things uh, earlier by surfacing uh, results that uh, are likely to in, um, increase the risk of uh, self-harm, uh, <laughs> which we know that uh, people with mood disorders are at risk for, uh, that's a negative. Uh, and, you know, if you're just optimizing for behavior like click through, you don't know which one the engine is learning to do. If you have some proxy for well-being uh, that comes out of people's language, that comes uh, that can be linked back to reports of their own well-being or their actual preferences. Um, and you can prove that that proxy generalizes to different kinds of people across cultures. I mean, that's ultimately the goal. So I think uh, in, the, in, in the short term, incorporating emotional behaviors into technologies that can use them to optimize for things like the treatment of, uh, of developmental disorders uh, is very interesting. In the long term, it's going to be optimizing for things that involve emotional behaviors as a proxy for well-being and as a proxy for uh, meeting people's goals and preferences. For me, uh, the things that I'm most excited about um... Uh, you know, touch on some of those aspects that have been mentioned before, but particularly focus on um, giving 
people, individuals, the ability to um, help understand more about how uh, how things in their life kind of affect their behavior and affect their well-being. Um, so to take uh, Alex's example of the coffee as, as a sort of just as a, 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 an exemplar, you know, there are many things in our lives that affect um, how we behave and, and um, often it's it's through trial and error that we discover the things that work for us and we don't have many tools to help us necessarily identify those things and sometimes we're not even aware of um, of the change, you know, how things affect our behavior or if they affect our behavior. Um, so for myself, you know, looking at this type of data for myself over periods of time, I've identified patterns that show that, you know, I'm, I'm more likely to express negative affect in the afternoons than in the mornings um, because I've looked at my own longitudinal data and I've seen this very repeatable pattern. That was not something I was aware of. I didn't realize that my tiredness across the course of the day meant that I um, physically appeared differently to people. Like I would be more likely to communicate um, in a, with more negative, um, with expressions that might be construed as more negative in different, you know, in the afternoon versus in the morning. Um, and and you, we have to be very careful about how this technology is used. But I think, you know, you know we, we have a lot of, we have tools for, for tracking health metrics and looking at how um, our exercise impacts our heart rate. Um, I do believe that there could be similar tools that could help us understand how our lifestyle parameters, you know, Im impact our, um, our well-being. And one way to give people feedback on their well-being is to allow them to, um, you know, be able to access this data and, 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 understand it in their context and interpret it for them and, and then use it to help um, make um, you know changes that they want to see so most of what I want to see is is this technology in the hands of individuals to use it to, to help help them um, some of the large-scale applications uh, I, I certainly can see um, how it could be used in search contexts and other things, um, but also I'm very cautious about how um, how we would want to bring these very personal, um, often very personal pieces of information into large scale systems. Yeah. So I basically just gonna repeat very quickly some of the points that i agree with uh, strongly uh, i agree with all of them but uh, i think that uh, the application of trying to first understand um, and then help diagnose psychopathologists is an important one the heterogeneity of, of uh, psychopathologists make it really hard to to diagnose um, so it would be certainly very helpful to understand more about them. And there is a debate of how much we can help and how much we can harm. So it's a debate that we need to have, but uh, that would be absolutely extraordinary if we could um, be of help in that regard. To me in particular, the most important one is the recognition of intent, as I mentioned at the very beginning. And anything that you do, well, I'd say anything, but almost everything that you do with, well, probably not us, but the general public do with computers, cell phones, tablets, uh, any device that they use is they are giving information to that device and the device needs to understand the intent of that user, right? And someone has mentioned search as the quintessential uh, example of that uh, when I do, uh, when I write a query in search or I say a few words to my device, I want my device to understand my intent. What do I actually want? And that is a really hard problem. And by just studying the syntactic and the semantics of a sentence or a few sentences, you are not guaranteed to get to the intent. You need a lot of other variables, especially affect, 
but also what we were talking about earlier, right? That contextual information, that cultural information, that situation where you're situated in, all of that is extremely relevant. And I certainly love to have a lot of data sets that can start helping address as uh, help address these problems. And someone has mentioned earlier about um, self-report of intent. And I think this is a fantastic idea. This is what we've been trying to do, right? Let people tell us what they intend us because it's very clear and then try to, to discover what are the affect variables that are relevant for that intent. Well, thank you all for the answers. Um, when, I'd like to open it to any of the audience if anyone has a question. Um, live on the Zoom that they'd like to ask. Okay, I have another, I can ask another one actually. So, um, I think one thing that has, uh, I think, been complex to understand is there's like arousal affect, there's emotion categories, um, there's like, in I think a lot of your researches, you've discovered that um, the landscape of expressions and emotions is much more complex, um, like even with the states versus traits and everything. Um, what should we study? Like what? have we discovered are the most important things to study? What is um, easiest to study, like most replicable? Um, how do we look at this complex landscape of how we describe emotion and affect? Um, and um, what are the, what's the way forward? What should we be doing now um, that we haven't been doing in the past? This is a very contentious topic. Uh, <laughs> I, I can give you um, my five cents on what I think we should do, but obviously we need different viewpoints because this is under debate, right? What our research uh, has shown is that emotion categories or affect variables like valence and arousal are actually not what's implemented in the brain, in the human brain, I mean. And that goes back to my implementation level of uh, David Marr's architectural levels. Um, so what we have shown is that the, the dimensions, if you will, of the computational space that we have in our brains, meaning the algorithm basically. So if you consider a cognitive or computational space where there are certain dimensions that the brain computes and then extracts the information from that multi-dimensional space, then uh, the dimensions are the facial muscle articulations, the change in facial color that I've alluded to, the body pose, the biological motion of that agent, the interaction with other agents, the contextual information, the situation. So all those are important variables. And then when you run this uh, psychological experiments, it's actually uh, perceivable as either emotion categories or um, continuous variables like affect uh, variables, uh, arousal and, uh, and others. But we have shown, and we have some papers on that, where we have shown that those are actually just illusions in our model that are actually, that actually arise from those underlying true competitions that the brain does. I know others will disagree, but this is a, a very interesting debate that we're having in the scientific community right now. Um, I'm happy to go next. Uh, so, you know, in, in my view, we ultimately need to be able to predict something that's of relevance to people, right? And so uh, the key thing then, I think in the, in the context of like mood disorders, it's pretty obvious and the measures for mood disorders contain things like, are you feeling bad? Are you feeling good? Basically self-reported mood, right? Um, and so ultimately the answer there is to develop treatments that make people feel better. Uh, and that depends on self-report as well. I think if you go to like Russ Poldrack's research, um, he compares a lot of different self-report methods with a lot of different task-based methods and behavioral methods. And the self-report methods have 
the most predictive value by far. They predict like 90% of the variance and the task grade method is predict like 10% of the variance and whether people are gonna succeed in like losing weight or, uh, or quitting cigarettes or, you know, the things that people really wanna do, um, right? And uh, these things are a function of you know day-to-day -day behavior. You can get self-report from ecological momentary assessment methods where people are buzzed on their phone and they say like, I'm feeling good right now. Um, and that's very predictive of you know the onset of different mental um, strains and disorders and uh, symptoms. Um, and so we really need to get a handle on the subjective, I think. Uh, we also really need to get a handle um, on uh, you know what are the outcomes that we're interested in. Uh, I mean, people want to actually quit smoking and they want to you know whatever whatever their goals are, um, and how we can actually build technologies that have some predictive value in that domain. Um, so, uh, if the goal is to, is for, if people want to, uh, quit doing something, um, it's not always clear where you separate their long-term intent from their short-term intent, right? So if they're pulling out a cigarette, uh, their short-term intent to smoke, their long-term intent may not, maybe to quit smoking. Uh, and so those could be at odds with each other very often. Um, and so what you want to be able to predict is long-term well-being and long-term intent. Those kind of go hand in hand. People intend to improve their well-being over time. They want to be more satisfied with their life. Um, and they have different ideas about how to make that happen. Um, and so we need to get closer to that. Um, we need to get closer to the uh, measures that are of relevance to people um, and understand what it is that predicts those measures. You know, what is it that predicts a healthy relationship? I mean, Gottman and Levinson's work, emotional expression was really at the center of uh, predicting uh, whether married couples would stay together um, whether people who are dating would get married um, and uh, being able to uh, make that assessment in a way to, for people to use it um, that it's useful to people. Um, I think you really need to have uh, the outcome data or some proxy for it that's closer um, to what the outcome data would tell you. So people's conversations um, and you have a measure of empathy, um, people reacting to videos and you have a measure of whether they actually liked the video or not. Um, and more specifically, of what are the different you know, feelings that it evokes that cause them to either like it um, or not? Because in some cases, uh, you want to feel sadness. You know, if you're if you're looking at your uh, friend's post on Facebook um, and it's about a tragedy that happened to them, it's in your interest to feel sadness so that you can express sorrow, uh, and it works better from a social interaction perspective. Um, and so it's not, of course, always just about happy, sad. It really is understanding um, people's affect and whether it's appropriate to the context that they're in. Um, and so we need to understand what those contexts are. We need to understand what the outcomes are, whether they're good or bad. Um, and we need to have some embedding. Basically, I think to get all of that, we need an embedding of facial expression that predicts, uh, for example, predict perceptions of facial expression. You know, like, it, it, like one of the things that should be predicted by facial muscle movements is how people perceive those facial muscle movements. Um, reliably across different people, right? Um, and if there's something missing there, if you can take two facial expressions that have different uh, perceptions because they have different facial muscle movements and everything else is held constant, um, you, need a, you need to make sure that whatever you're using to measure facial muscle movements can capture those perceptions or you know, whatever it else that's reliably predicted by the expression. Um, and, and, and so I, know, I think we have some ways to go before we get there. Um, we can derive those embeddings. I think we need to derive those embeddings from the outcomes, from psychologically relevant measures. Um, I think that, uh, and, and this will be very controversial, um, but I think that facts um, is you know, a good start. I think it only really captures about half the variance in facial muscle movements and it hasn't really been validated fully. Um, but so I think like a, a good start would be to derive a measure of facial muscle movement that truly is comprehensive and unbiased and then be able to apply that on a large scale um, or a measure of body movements or a measure of emotion in the voice and be able to apply that at a large scale. Because generally speaking, you can't, you don't have enough data to go straight from like an audio, raw audio signal or raw video signal to an outcome variable like depression, for example. So you need some embedding. You need some embedding that captures all of the relevant variants in people's vocal, emotional expressions or facial emotional expressions so that you can apply it uh, to data that's not, you know, millions or hundreds of thousands, but maybe tens of thousands of samples um, and be able to say this person is responding, this person with depression is responding well to this drug and we can tell based on their uh, facial expressions. Um, and as a proxy, if you look at people's self-report, it predicts uh, their uh, depression level as well as self-report does, or maybe as better 
maybe better than self-reported. Even the self-report is built into the measure of depression. Maybe you can actually do better and more reliably with a passive measure of uh, uh, facial expression over the day than you can with uh, self-report in a therapy session, which is a you know, localized part of the day. So yeah, anyway, data with actual outcomes, uh, more data-driven approaches would be my, my general inclination. Yeah, so as Gotham, you mentioned, like, it feels like the mental state or fact space really complex. Like, there are so many different elements in here. There, there We have, like, those emotion words that we're familiar with, but also other cognitive processes that we consider as mental states, like planning, decision making. Um, so I think one approach, as you mentioned, is um, understand the dimensions. But when we say dimension, they're actually groups of effective words or mental states that explain most of the variance in your data set. Um, but then this feels like the main trend, but um, it's important to understand the main trend, but also there are like different, are there different affected uh, states or emotion that might not best categorize in any of these main trends, like maybe Sheldon Floyer, for example, I don't know whether that's the case, but like this type of, very special or subtle emotions, they may not belong to any of this big category or dimensions, but it's this like, they also add to like, they make our life more colorful. So um, it's important to understand these main dimensions, but I also think that it's very interesting um, to understand this like, like outliers that does not belong to the big pictures. Um, so I think it's very hard to uh, answer the question of what like what the field should do, but I feel like if like each researcher study the, the topic that they're interested in and like really do it in like a transparent and like good research practice so, and then we can build this like knowledge accumulatively. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with many of those points. Um, the only other thing I'll sort of add, which I think is is maybe similar to some of the things that have been talked about, is that there are in 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 our research looking at, at longitudinal and diurnal patterns in expressed affect, we've seen um, you know lo lots of variations. Like in social contexts, when we know people are with other people, you know dramatically changes their facial displays and so and and these feel like things that we should be able to build more um computational models for um and and there's there's certainly a lot of research on analyzing facial expressions for instance in in group interactions and things like that um but it's uh you know when it when if we can if we can build data sets and models that help us disentangle um yeah you know, again the intention of, of of these observed behaviors so you know am i smiling because i want to build rapport with you or am i smiling because uh, you know something you said delighted me um am i smiling to be polite like or, you know the same action occurs in 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 many different contexts with many different meanings um, and it feels like these are these are things that we can start to we can answer some of these um, base rate questions with with um, data that we already have. Uh, so I, I'm not I'm not sure what the right model exactly for emotion is, but um, coming from the the this, the side of the field that's looking at building tools to measure observable things and and then do that at scale um, i think this is one thing that we can we can certainly do more of is to answer very fundamental questions which are about just the base rates of these different um, expressions under different contexts um, and, and alan's work is a great example of that and we've done some work also looking at cross-cultural you know, propensity for to to observe facial expressions in in-group and out-group settings and things like that, and and I think there's just a uh, that that would be very useful for 
informing, I think, um, the, 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 the models that we can develop, which, which, which may be our taxonomies for different emotional states or things like that. But um, there's still a lot we can do, even if we don't have perfect models for emotion. Well, thank you for that. And I know we're at the hour um, for the workshop. We have a few minutes um, that we can go in over it. But if you have to leave right now, please feel free to do so. Um, I know there's just one final question. Um, so I thought we could do that, but um, feel free to drop off if you have a scheduling conflict. Um, so the question is, it seems like everyone agrees with data sets um, being very important and kind of building off what Daniel was talking about with computational models. Um, in terms of methodologies and techniques, what are important next steps we have to make in order to progress on effective understanding? Um, I mean, you can take this in many directions, but uh, I'll go ahead and take it in the psychology direction because I'm a psychologist. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, we could work on, of course, algorithms and models and so forth. Um, I think uh, one thing we really need um, in the field are methodologies for valid representations of extracting valid representations of psychological constructs like empathy, right? Um, so that we can build the AI technologies that we want to build. If we want to build empathic digital assistance, we should have some representation of what empathy is and how you can generate data where you can actually measure empathy. Uh, and, and so there's some preliminary psychology work that needs to be done there um, that you know, I'm hoping to do. And you can get that data from conversations between people and asking them uh, what the you know, amount of empathy they have, or you can look at objective metrics like the success of their relationship um, as proxies. Um, but I think, yeah, we really need carefully designed experiments. Um, I think the focus on uh, public data or posed data, um, I think poses the problem that you don't really understand what's going on um, from a psychological perspective because you don't have psychological control, the kind of control you would have in a controlled psychological experiment. Um, and so I think there's a lot more large scale experimentation that needs to be done so that you can take these two fields and really bring them together. You can have a valid psychological construct and you can predict it using machine learning. Um, and I think that's the sort of work that has really been missing, um, in my opinion, um, from a lot of what we do, because you know there isn't much interaction between the affective computing and psychology. I realize now that we have a few people from the psychology world, um, which is great. I, I think that that's um, an incredible development um, that we can bring those worlds together. But I think that the reason uh, that there hasn't been that merger is because um, the data being collected in affective computing is not really being collected in a way that you could answer questions in psychology with it. Um, and the data that's being collected in psychology isn't really being collected in a way that you could answer questions in affective computing with it. But if that's the case, how could you predict valid psychological constructs with the data that's being collected in affective computing if you can't uh, publish a paper in a psychology journal that says this is a valid prediction of you know, X, Y, and Z? Um, so I think you know, it, the, whether those fields are brought together will be a good proxy um, for uh, whether uh, we brought um, sort of new methodologies um, uh, to bear on, uh, on really important questions in affective computing. Yeah, yeah, completely uh, agree with that. I think that's extremely valuable and, and I, I think you know, more, more, more interaction, more collaboration between communities is, 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 a, is a good thing. And we, I think we've still got a good way to go and a lot to, in doing that. Um, it, it's, there's been collaborations, of course, um, in the past to develop, you know, many of the um, important, um, a lot of the important work that's got us this far, but, but I, I think that is still there's still a lot of um, things to do and from my perspective um, I think just building off of that really is is we have the opportunity to um, I think now get much much richer data you know I still st still thinking about you know observing someone for a few seconds and, and attempting to make a, an assessment of 
um, their their feelings, you know, is 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 such a limited view of you know what you could possibly do um, in this space. And so, um, you know, my particular bias is to to look at you know longitudinal measurement to try to understand um, you, you know is there more we can learn about how um, uh, about about people's overall well-being and how we can um, design technology to support people um, to, you know, help reduce stress or improve overall um, quality of life. And there, that that data is going to reveal, I'm sure, many new things that we we didn't know before. And, and as Alan described, like did, collecting that data in such a way that it can answer the right questions from a psychology perspective, I think will be very valuable, um, not just being limited by what we can do technologically, but thinking about, you know, what are the right questions to ask and, and how is it, how can we design those experiments both to get the richest insights, but also in ways that are, um, you know, very um, sensitive to all of the big kind of ethical questions that I think we face also as a field. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, to me, it's, it's there, there's a lot of exciting opportunities and, and really um, I'd love to see, I'd love to see more of that type of work in, you know, coming into, into these, into these conferences is, is um, going beyond just trying to beat benchmarks on, on existing data sets, but thinking about um, how we can really, you know, bring in um, expertise from psychology to inform um, the types of computer science um, approaches to the, to to, um, to to sensing and, and measurement. Uh, Jinju, do you go first? Or I actually don't have much to add. So yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll go next then. Um, so I I think that we have to take a step back. I just I think I understand the question. Uh, we've talked a lot about data sets and sorry about the methods. I think I want to take a step back and say that the important question is not the data set or the methods, but actually the scientific question that we want to answer. A data set is only as good as, and the methods, by the way, right? The data set and the methods are only as good as what they can answer, what they can address, uh, what scientific questions they can um, illuminate or give some light on. So I'm going to give the example because uh, it's, again, let me take a step back. Uh, people usually downgrade the role of uh, data sets. Uh, it's only been until very recent years that CVPR and conferences like this are actually taking this very seriously. But in the biological sciences, that has been the case for many, many, many years. So for example, one of the most famous and important scientific breakthroughs of the 21st century has been the completion of the human genome. And that's just a data set. That's what it is. There's nothing else. But it's a very it's a data set that's created to answer a certain number of very fundamental and important scientific questions. And I think that not only the data set, but then the methods that were developed to mine that data set were developed to answer those questions. And that's what we need to do as a community. And then the second thing I wanted to address um, that I think uh, Daniel has alluded to already is the ethics of what we're trying to do. So I'm going to disagree with Alan when he said that uh, we could collect data on couples, for example, and then see whether you know long term they're going to get married or they're going to survive marriage over the long haul. I want to caution people to address questions like that I, or questions. <laughs> I don't mean do it without their consent. okay uh, but because this has been done for example in hiring people right and i think that we can do more harm than good 
in those occasions, right? We don't want to tell people you have to fit into that mold to be successful. Everyone's successful in different ways. So I think that the ethics of um, AI in general, but specifically here of effective computing are very important and uh, they have been pretty overlooked to that point. So I like to see more of that as well. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I just want to comment because you mentioned ethics that uh, I am forming a nonprofit um, that is putting together ethical guidelines for the scientific inquiry side of things and uh, building AI according to uh, use cases that are approved ethically. So I, I'm totally on board with that. And in terms of the data, I think everything should be collected with consent, um, with you know, people's full informed consent of what the data is gonna be used for and what you can extract from it. And that's something that uh, to some extent is covered in current privacy laws, um, like GDPR. Uh, and so compliance with those laws often gets you there, but it needs to go even further when it comes to affect because often you don't know what can be extracted from the data set. Well, I, I wanted to, that it looks like we're about 11 minutes over, but I wanted to thank all of you for your amazing talks and also for the diverse perspectives you brought to the state of effective understanding research today. Um, it was an amazing experience to hear all of this. Um, and yeah, thanks again. Well, thanks, thanks so much for, for having us. And yeah, thank you. Thank looking you. forward to more discussion. Yeah. And for everyone else, um, our next event will be at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that will be the talks going over the competition. See you then. See you.